I was interested in what you said about intimacy with the monarch and, and sexuality and that sexuality in this period was a very double-edged thing. Yes, because on the one hand, um, no one was, was closer to the king than the queen. That made her very powerful. Um, it made people want to seek her favor. It made her a, a source of advancement, of promotion. She, she could literally whisper in his ear. There's a, there's a lovely um, Latin complaint by some London monks against uh, Eleanor of Provence who accuse her I think the Latin word is nictrix, nightbird, the king's mm. nightbird. Of course, because that represents the, the other side of, of, of the sexual aspect is it, of the royal relationship, which is that the queen could be very easily blamed. I mean, you know, ever since Eve, if there's a problem uh, in the garden, blame a woman. So queens were consistently blamed for the bad judgment of the king. It was a way of saving the king's face, in a way. You know, if, if he did something stupid, it was the queen's fault. And if he did something clever, it was, it was you know, his own achievement. But it meant that queens were quite often vilified particularly because up until the mid-15th century, they were by and large foreigners. So they were often perceived as, as the enemy in, in the royal bed. And so their sexuality was, again, a source of strength, but potentially a source of, of great vulnerability. And you mentioned earlier the intercessive role that yes. they played as a sort of way of mollifying the sort of masculine authoritarian aspects of, of power and bringing some kind of feminization to it. Yes, I mean, this is one of the, the motifs, the, the tropes, if you like, which I, I found really fascinating. Um, there's a very famous and sentimental Victorian representation of um, Queen Philippa pleading for the burghers of Calais. It's quite a well-known picture. There's the Queen on her knees pleading with Edward not to uh, forget what he was going to do with them, have them have them shot with arrows, I imagine, or, or, or stabbed um, after he's taken Calais. Anyway, if Queen Philippa goes down on her knees and, and Edward is, is moved by her tears and, you know, the, the burghers are freed. And this represents a really sort of crucial moment for the intercession motif in English medieval history because prior to that, intercession had been a means of negotiating gender power in a quite specific way. The woman represents gentleness, softness, tenderness. The man, the king, the sort of harsh face, the stern face of justice. And in interceding with, with her lord, with her king, the queen is able to allow him to show compassion, but without appearing emasculated. This is very, very important in, in sort of Saxon and, and Norman England. What's happening is, as the period moves along is that this idea of intercession becomes more and more ceremonial. It's no longer of any real political value. It doesn't really change anything. And of course, the famous scene of, of Philippa and the Burgers of Calais turns out to have been a complete fabrication. It was reported by a witness who wasn't actually there. She went down on her knees sort of 14 days after they were released. What we realise is that the whole thing was staged and it was, it's, it was staged in order at, at to show Edward, to show the public face of, of the King's compassion as evinced by, by the intercession of the Queen. And as we move further along towards um, the early 16th century where my, where my book ends, we see intercession becoming simply part of a ritual. Uh, Anne of Bohemia at uh, Richard II's coronation is, is, is and his coronation at, at her coronation is required to make a sort of token gesture of intercession on behalf of the citizens of London. Elizabeth of York at her coronation does likewise, but neither are particularly meaningful. Whereas at the beginning of the period, the intercessions of, of Norman queens actually did uh, make huge, huge differences. So I think it's interesting in its own right as a means of showing how a woman could exercise power early on in the period. But I think it's also perhaps more interesting in that it reflects to a certain extent the pattern of queenship and queenly power, which reaches its apex, in my opinion, in the 11th and 12th centuries, has a brief fillip with uh, Isabella of France and then, then gradually declines. And it's not really until the 16th century and the first English Queen's Regnant that we see women again in, in significant positions of monarchical power. And by the time you get to the 16th century and Queen's Regnant, is there any, in any sense, a sort of model for their behaviour provided by the Queen's consort? Or are they, do they have to invent that oh, form of abs absolutely. monarchy for themselves? Absolutely, I think there is. Um, we have to remember that, in, in, you know, for, for Mary and Elizabeth, these women were not only 
their relatives, literally their relatives, but they were, they were much, much closer to them. And then there, there were probably still people alive whose parents could remember the Wars of the Roses. In Elizabeth's case, when, when she was a, a young woman, and who could remember possibly, possibly even having seen Marguerite of Anjou or know of her. And she, she was a great warrior queen. I mean, she, she, she led armies into battle. She fought and fought and fought for years to um, gain the crown for, for her son. And although she failed and was, was vilified by, by Shakespeare as, as a monster, I think she was nevertheless an extremely potent example of, um, of queenship for her descendants. And looking further back, we must also not neglect the fact that piety was an extremely significant queenly attribute, and one which is very important in the development of vernacular culture in England. One way in which women could exercise their talents, their intellects, compete with men, was by cultural patronage, particularly religious patronage, um, which again, early in the period, was pretty much the only patronage that's going on. But because as the church reforms and becomes more rigid and codified, women are by and large shut out from it um, because of their lack of knowledge of Latin, they patronise instead vernacular literature. So you have this, this sort of great pious tradition of, of women founding um, monasteries, providing abbesses, libraries for nuns, um, schools, hospitals, all, all that you know, religious power associated with, with, with the Queen's role. And at the same time you have this, this which grows out of that, this, this intellectual role, which is a, you know, the development of, of um, vernacular culture, particularly literature and painting. Elizabeth Woodville and Elizabeth of York were the first patrons of uh, William Caxton. He obviously bought the printing press in, and they were amongst his first customers, the first buyers of printed books. That's at the end of the period. At the beginning of the period, you have the first um, vernacular translations from the Latin uh, into Norman French being commissioned by queens.